So I'm going to do a brief introduction to IFIT. Many of you, fortunately, already know about IFIT. Many of you give talks, attend conferences. But for those who don't know, I will quickly give you a crash course on what IFIT is. That will be maybe five minutes, even if it's a lot of slides. I put a lot of text in the slides for reference. They will be made available. But I'm not going to read everything that's on it. Just give you a quick introduction. <coughs> then the main focus of this of the speech is on, on the ICT professional. I've got three key words. Ability, willingness, and profession. Not professional, but the profession. You'll learn what I mean by that. IFIT was established in 1960 as a result of the first World Computer Congress in Paris. We were established under the umbrella of UNESCO, and we're still very proud of that. We're an international federation, a non-governmental organization, not for profit, and we're based in uh, Austria. But um, our staff is two and a half people, and the rest is volunteers, which is a very strong commitment of the volunteers. <coughs> We've got three and a half thousand people somehow involved in, in work in IFIT. The mission statement, and I've highlighted the words of the keynote of today, professional and social responsible development of ICT systems. What does it mean? How can we achieve that? How can you contribute to that with your research and your work in your companies? We've got a lot of structures. I can show you the organization schedule, but just what I want to mention is we have got uh, 13 technical committees, 100 plus working groups, and there is the technical work being done. So a lot of research, a lot of activities, and we are a federation of societies. So all these societies, like the GE in Germany, Gesellschaft für Informatik, uh, British Computer Society, South African Computer Society, whatever you may, we've got 50 plus members representing roughly 70 countries all over the world. Each of them have their own set of conferences, and many of them have even more than we do. So a lot of work being done to advance the field. I won't bother you with all the governance structures, executive committees. We have a general assembly once a year where the member societies hold us accountable for what we've done. We try to engage the younger people, and I'm happy to see um, every year that I've become a year older, I can say I see younger people more and more, so that's good to note. We try to engage the younger generation, younger students, but also the younger professionals, which is not easy nowadays to take their time to, to make them enthusiastic, to put time in, in societies that they can also use for their families, for their career, or for other nice things. IP3 is one of the key elements for the topic of today. We have an international professional practice partnership, quite a lot to say. They promote the professionalism of the ICT profession. We'll come back to that in the other slides. And I've mentioned already the Secretariat. If you're keen on organizations, teams, they're all in there. We're still proud of our relationship with UNESCO. We're still a, a member of society of UNESCO, some of, a particular kind of member of UNESCO. We're also a particular kind of member of ITU and of the International Council for Scientific Unions. So we leverage that. We are getting more and more actively involved. Interestingly, also these bodies are getting more and more interested in work on information security and insurance. Because if you look at, for instance, ITU, they have a, um, one of their goals is to, to help developing countries achieve the sustainable development goals to make sure they benefit from ICT. And of course, information security and insurance is a major element in that effort. And they're taking more and more interest in what others are doing. UN bodies in the past were UN bodies and they, they were going their own way, they thought they had it all. Now they're reaching out to other groups, hundreds of them, and I think it's one of them. We have lines of activities, it's not one body, if you have different types of societies, different backgrounds, different cultures, different emphasizes. So we've clarified a little bit what are we doing. We have technical activities, we have policy-oriented activities, that's an area where we would like to do more, and I might come back to you on that in the discussion part. We also, of course, try to support our member societies. Um, what can we do for them that they can't do on their own? We have members who are very strong, members who are very big. Uh, we have members that have uh, more than 100 staff, so they can do something. But we also have members that are small and limited in their means, and we try to help each other in, in whatever way we can. Professionalism, the fourth line of activities, I will expand on that a bit more later on, and digital equity, 
sustainable development goals of the United Nations. We try to, to participate in that as well. Like I mentioned, for reference, I listed all the strategic aims that we have for each line of activity. I will not go into that in detail, just read the blue lines, which is the main, the main thing covering those lines of activities. This is not the emphasis, but it still has slightly a, a, a touch of what we're talking about today, the responsible application in, in different ways. I like the yellow, the one that we're focusing on. I will give you a little bit more time to read what we want to do here. Promoting bodies of knowledge, promoting common skills and competencies frameworks, accreditation, certification, and of course, lifelong learning. And learning every day. Digital equity, sustainable development goals. Recently, the whole world is jumping on the sustainable development goals, which is a good thing to do. Now, the first one was the Millennium Development Goals with the target date of 2015. Now we're targeting on 2030 to get things done in that respect. And mind you, it's not only the developing countries, it's also a digital equity in your own, in, in developed countries where minority groups uh, are lagging behind in the application of ICT and benefiting from ICT. When thinking about this speech, I thought, okay, how can I explain why I want to emphasize the ICT professional compared to the user. Working on that, I got myself into a little trouble, a little bit of trouble, because basically the difference is not that big. If you look at, at the should work, user versus ICT professional, and we can discuss the versus later on, it's about systems and security measures, professional design, develop, etc. Users use and operate. Both have need to have knowledge, skills, and competencies provided by education, certification, accreditation. There needs to be a willingness to act responsible and accountable, also applicable to both groups. And I will talk to you a little bit more about the term duty of care, which is becoming a bit more fashionable nowadays. And maybe we will have to look at our profession. So I'll try to, to address all these. The blue words are the key words in my, in my talk. You can argue, you can, you can find new words, but I think you can put everything under this umbrella. Why? I'm probably preaching to the converted and stating the obvious, but there is plenty of examples, and I'm, I'm working, like Steve said, for the Dutch Central Bank, the Bundesbank, the Reserve Bank in the Netherlands, uh, working in business continuity, critical infrastructure protection, and in the financial sector, we have had quite a few recent cases, I only picked up a few recent cases that show the need for security and, and assurance. It's all in the headlines. I could have dug up lots of, of cases where due to bad design of systems and building of systems, even lives are at stake, lives being lost. So there's a clear need to pay attention to security and to professionalism. Yes, sir. Can you go back to 515? Sorry? Uh, what's interesting here, you have this dichotomy between users and ICT professionals. Yes. And if you look at standards like HIPAA, where in security you require the medical staff that are not the users in the sense, I mean, you have the end users and the users, you consider users and end users the same. But you have to, once a year you have to be certified by HIPAA in the healthcare. Sector. So that's word users, you have more categories than that. Yes, well, I, I try to make the table not too complicated, but I think when I talk about users, I'm talking about end users and consumers. So um, like medical staff that uses medical devices for the day. In, in this sense, I would consider them as end users, because they're using medical equipment. They're using it, they're not developing it, designing it, building it, and maintaining it. Uh, users is a broad category. That's that's true. It's not the only only me sitting behind my, my laptop at home and, and using a website to buy stuff, or, or sitting in the office and using the office. Because uh, like the, the European driver's license for IT. Yeah, well, that's that's 
I didn't put it in the slides, but I was going to mention it briefly uh, later on. It's, if you look at the driver's license, that's a basic thing for the real end user to say, okay, I've got a basic knowledge about basic things like Excel, Word, and, and that's... So, so there is some certification on the user side? Yes. It's not a slide. Well... Okay, thank you. You could, you could mention this. I, I put it on there. So I, yeah. It's a difference. Sorry. No, don't worry. It's, like I said, please interrupt because I like this to be interactive and otherwise I probably have to be more water than only one bottle. In the financial sector, we've got a, I've highlighted three cases. Uh, this one I'm not so familiar with, but I just put it on because of the size, the size of the amount of money in, involved. 650 million pounds stolen. There was a case last year where people managed to, to influence the exchange rate just by a quick interaction, 15 minutes, you can buy and sell rubles against dollars, you can manipulate courses and earn a lot of money. And nobody noticed until a few months later. And people are denying, of course, that this happened. This one is the most famous at the moment in our sector, the Bangladesh heist. Previous ones were done with commercial banks, and you might say, well, commercial banks, they have commercial interests, they might pay a little bit less attention to security because they also want to take higher risks. This was in a central bank, in a reserve bank. So this is getting people nervous because if something like this can happen to a reserve bank, where is the trust in our financial system? What, what can we do to prevent this? And I didn't know well, copy the part of it, it was called the Bangladeshi SWIFT heist because it was done by the SWIFT network, but without going into much details, it was caused by flaws in the bank that was participating in the network, not by the SWIFT network itself. It all shows, and I'll, I will refer back to these examples in a minute or in, in later on, it's a, it's a matter of security culture, attitudes, uh, perceptiveness, and knowledge about what to do. But culture is definitely an, an interesting one. So what are we talking about? Ability, and I mean, again, I can click back and forth to the, to the matrix. A job is a job description and requirements. You need education and qualifications to get, to get the job, and you need skills and competencies to do the job right. I mentioned them already in Matrix. Education is probably more your field than mine. I'm not from academia, I'm not from educational areas, so this is all the subsequent programs that you have to follow to be uh, trained, to get your diplomas, your certificates, your degrees. And the other element, certification, is an interesting one. What you see in industry often is that the regular education programs are supplemented by, by certificates. During your lifetime, you can add on certificates, like I did. I will show you a few of the certificates I, I had, I only have two, which are actually basically the same as what I got in the Netherlands, and the other one was the international equivalent for that. But you can add, in, in specialized areas, you can become a certified IT auditor, a certified security professional, etc. Train. We'll have a discussion later on with you to see whether that's the way to go or whether this should be implemented more in the education program in general. And then the accreditation, because many discussions I have, people mix up the terminology. That's why I'd say education, certification, accreditation. Three totally different <coughs> concepts, very often mixed and, and uh, basis for misunderstanding. Accreditation is done to institutions who accredit programs, you accredit institutions, you don't accredit persons, you certify persons. Like I said, this is not my field, this will appeal to more, more to you, the Bologna process, Erasmus programs, Solar Accord, where, where many of the member societies of IFIT are involved in, to, to have mutual agreements on, on curricula, etc. And there will be many more examples you can figure out this for, for yourself. Certification, in, in, in a way, it's a very good thing. 
because it gives you the opportunity to um, gain knowledge and show that you've gained that knowledge. In many cases, you also have to add some practical work experience in addition to doing exams. Um, a good thing. But are we now exaggerating? I will come back to the money issue in a minute. What you see is that many of the programs have a long history, have a good, uh, good uh, reputation in, in, in the world, in, in the industry, for instance. If you want to hire an IT auditor, you look for certifications. You look for a certified information systems auditor. Um, what you see is that the organizations providing these certification programs, they see over the years it's an increase in interest, it's an increase in students and members, and then the, the growth fades. So they look for new areas of income, money. They want to earn money, they new, look for new areas of income. But what you've seen, for instance, in the body that I'm a member of as well, is you have a certified IP auditor, which was actually the starting point. But then they start with a certified information security management professional, with a security manager, with a certified the CGEIT, Certified Governance Enterprise IT Professional. So they keep adding programs, they, like universities. I've checked the university and I, I stopped trying to figure out what is it that they offer. Because 30, 40, 50 courses, programs, degrees, certificates. All to make a distinction, all to make money. Personally, uh, if I would be in an HR department, get desperate if I look at all the things that people provide. You have to check everything that's offered. So there might be an interesting issue to look at in the future. And there are different levels. Some are certifi cert certificates, some are really certified, some are membership qualifications. So it's not so easy to see which of the seven post-nominal business cards sometimes carry are really valid. I've taken an example of the IEEE Computer Society. Software engineering as a profession is a well-established thing, and IEEE CS is well acknowledged for, for having a solid, good structure and program. I just want to show, I will click it to its full extent, what elements are part of a profession. A curriculum, accreditation career criteria for that curriculum, like I mentioned, if you credit the curriculum, you have competencies, professional development programs, standards of practice, codes of ethics, I will refer to that in, in a couple of times as well. And then they call that a body of knowledge. Also, very often a terminology that's causing confusion. What do you mean by body of knowledge? And discussions, whether we can achieve one. Then you go to the professional education, skills development, and you will get a certificate, or you will get license. Another term, might cause confusion, but anyway. All the elements in this picture will, will be referred to in, in, uh, in one way or the other. I think basically this is covering the whole area as well. Full professional status. The European Union a couple of years ago started work on uh, taking stock of everything that's being done in, in um, competencies. They wanted to have a check what is, what is the competencies field with the aim of drafting a competencies framework. So there was a report in 2012, big report, 370 pages, inventory of all the programs available, all the different types of partners that are playing a role. I didn't put that slide in here. It was a very dark, black, big, complex diagram. You can look at the report. It's available on the website. And that result of the, again, uh, concluded in the management summary, bodies of knowledge, professional ethics, education and training, and competencies are the four building blocks. So whatever order, whatever terminology you use, basically it's, it's a limited number of elements that make up for a profession. And that resulted in the, in the European Competence Framework, which is now being heavily promoted. And I have to tell you, this took quite a long time before the, the uh, civil servants and, and decision makers in the European Union realized that this was worthwhile doing. Because they were very hesitant to draft the framework, to promote it, uh, 
and again, an element of money, different party, parties wanted to make money out of that, so everybody has an interest in driving this one way or the other. But now they have launched it, they, have prom they are promoting it, in many countries it's taken up, and um, organizations and even governments are, are promoting this, that if you're going to hire personnel, you should look at their competencies and you can use the e-competence framework to, to, uh, as a reference point. In IFIT, like I mentioned, IP3 is working on that element as well. They want to promote certification programs. They want to promote credit uh, programs, for instance, by uh, computer societies. They refer to the SFIA framework, Skills Framework for the Information Age, which is a well-known framework in the more Anglo-Saxon-oriented world. Um, so when discussing with the European Union, charge, they were saying, ah, oh, that's we are Anglo-Saxon, and then we were, oh, we were in Germany, here. Yeah. sorry. In different countries, they said, well, this is not exactly our thing. So, there was a big fear that one framework would be dominant, and one framework would be pushed uh, forward as the only one. So, finally, people came to their senses and said, we have more than one model, we have more than one framework. As long as they are pretty comparable, you can, you can manage to, to compare the, the, the majority of the elements in it. It doesn't matter whether you use the European one, the Sphere one. I was in Singapore a few years ago, they have an Asian one. So find out where are the, the differences and see whether they are acceptable or not. And that might be an interesting research area or a job for bodies like I do. So that's, that's the ability part. I think that's not, not uh, rocket science. It's not, not very surprising. Most of the things you've probably heard of. What I'm trying to, to address here in a bit more depth is um, the element of willingness. Security professionals, ICT professionals, and also users, by the way, in whatever form, they have to act responsible accountable, but they have to be able to do so, and they have to be willing to do so. I think willingness is, is definitely uh, getting attention more and more. We have codes of conduct, code of ethics in, in many of the computer societies, in many of the professional work environments. But what does it mean if you sign up to that? <laughs> what are you committing yourself to? Uh, is it something you just sign because you have to, otherwise you don't get the job? And if somebody's approaching you about something you've done which is not completely in line with this code, how would you react? You say, oh, I didn't know that this was in the small print and if I had known, I wouldn't have signed up. So it's, it's also a responsibility for the individual on both sides. Um, <clears throat> IFIT has worked on a topic for a long time already. Uh, of course, initially, like all of us, we want to go for the one fantastic, only applicable model but we soon found out that that's uh, impossible given the different cultures, the different, different habits in countries, the impossibilities sometimes in a legal aspect <coughs> to, to say we have one code of conduct or code of ethics that can be applied by every country, by every profession. So what we've done in, in the late 80s, draft, take stock of what was available, we, we analyzed it and um, came up with some recommendations that um, the elements that a good code of ethics should contain. That each country, each profession should, should tailor made it to their own likings. And that's actually a process still going on. It's still something in the, in the focus of attention. We have one or two groups in IFIT that are still working on that. There's still every now and then somebody who says, we can't we draft an international code of ethics, but It's elements to be taken into account and to discuss. And again, like, like the skills frameworks, there's not one that's the best. Make sure you have got the key elements included. Now, a term I'm not sure whether you're familiar with that. It's, it's closely related to, to uh, codes of conduct, code of ethics. And to my personal belief, this is going to be a hot topic in the next two or three years. The Dutch. Uh, government was the president of the European Union the first six months of this year. 
you know, all in cyber security and cyberspace is, uh, was one of their main topics for that six months. And they've done some work in the past, uh, in the previous years, uh, to prepare for that. We've had a few high level meetings, and one of those meetings was <coughs> on the future of cybersecurity in Europe. It was a small group uh, organized by the Cybersecurity Council in Europe, which is a public private partnership. And um, there was about 20 25 people from industry, government, and from research discussing two topics actually. Um, one topic was the Internet of Things as the new hot topic to address uh, for the next few years. The other one was duty of care. Well, I'm not going to work on, on talk on given other things, the duty of care in the context of this speech is of interest. I had the pleasure and the honor to be invited and I, I presented some points on behalf of IFI. They asked a few questions to participants. The first one was, which parties had a duty of care? And that's where again my, my link with the distinction between the users, the government, the industry, because you many people say, okay, they are responsible. Industry is responsible if the product fails, because they built the product or the system. Uh, government is responsible because they should have provided legislation and means to, to enforce this, this uh, product reliability, liability, etc. But then again, I think um, it was a bit broader than that. So what I put forward, and the results are being processed now, even if it was done in May, People involved. They have seen the first draft of the final report. It will be presented to the European Commission one of these days, and then it will become available. So, will, if you're interested, I can point you, direct you to, to the final result. Um, so, my input there was the ICT professionals also has also a duty of care. Sorry, question. Yeah. When you have this discussion, did they uh, figure out why they're using a new term, cyber? Called ICT professionals, and you keep saying cybersecurity. Well, um, I'm always at risk when I, when I tell people, please um, don't emphasize the word cyber. Because if you put cyber in front of things, apparently it opens magic doors, it provides money. Yeah. Other than that, to be honest, whether you call it cybersecurity, information security, ICT security, who cares? Yes. Cyber no, security, so cyberspace, cyber. So the, the, the cyber is the, is the word that opens up doors to money. But the that's maybe a little bit of black and white yeah. position from my side. I said the Netherlands was a president that even approached that issue that they, what is cyber security? Oh. No. No. Okay. The latest one is cyber resilience, because everyone is now talking about resilience, yeah. including myself. So, go with the terminology, you, you, you can't avoid it, you can find it, you can say, look, uh, is that, what's the expression, it's the old wine in new, new, new bottles. bottles. <coughs> old wine in new bottles and yeah. same hangover. Yeah. <laughs> but before you reach the hangover, you still have a period where you're lucky. So that's, if you use the new term and you get lucky, you get attention. Because, to be honest, it helps to get attention. If you go to your CEO, to your, your board and say, look, I want to do some more on information security. They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing, we're doing that all right. We're doing that for the last few years. If you go to them and say, ah, oh, there's big cyber security risk and cyber crimes and cyber attacks and mention 10 times cyber and you get the, the attention. So should I call myself a cyber professional now then? <laughs> of course. But you need a certificate to get that soon. Okay. <laughs> But it's not only the professionals, it's still also the government and companies who have a duty of care and the individual user. Because if you're not paying attention to how to use your system or your product and you mess up, don't blame the others. Where do the duties consist of? That was the second question. Well, should be trained, have the right skills. I'm coming back to that in the discussion item. Who should be trained and where should be trained? Professional code of conduct, I mentioned that one. So you, hopefully you see I have a consistent story to come. This one is an interesting one. Um, 
that makes it difficult sometimes for professionals and also for users, by the way, to, to act responsible and to, to um, act accountable. Because you should resist pressure to launch a product which is not secure, not safe. Now, you're going to tell your manager, I'm not going to finish this product because of this and this reason in the time frame you tell me that you want it finished. Your manager will say, thank you very much, find yourself a new job. So it's not so easy to resist pressure to, to uh, launch products that are not secure enough. On the other side, companies should create conditions. And that's an appeal, I'm not sure how to, to achieve that goal. They should create conditions where people will come to you and say, look, I know you want to launch it in two weeks' time, but we're not ready, maybe postpone it for another month. And like I said, users have to act in the same way. Otherwise, you lose your right for claims and you will be liable. The other two questions I will uh, postpone to the discussion area. What challenges do you see? Well, that was a bit uh, future looking. The other one, and that's an interesting one, should the European Union harmonize this, this concept? And provide a legal framework. What you see is that, um, at least in the European context, we tend to, to legalize, to find new rules, new laws, new, new guides, new principles that you have to follow for every new problem that arises. So, <clears throat> how far should this go? The third word that I highlighted is the word profession. We are professionals, but are we a profession? Just to bring back the elements of the IEEE Computer Society. My colleagues in IP3, they drafted another circle. You probably won't be able to read it, I will. But the yellow one in our circle said you have to demonstrate mastery of a core body of specialized knowledge. And that's again, are we one profession? Are we a separate profession? If you talk about specialized knowledge, it can, be, it can be security professionals. Is that a security profession? And are we then part of the ICT profession or not? And maybe it's not relevant. Up to you to discuss. We're, I'm representing a professional body and, and, a, and a federation of professional bodies. My colleagues say the professional body's job is to develop professionals, help them in, in maintaining their profession increase the profession, not only on the personal level, but also in the world to look at us. Should we be comparable? Are we comparable to professions like the medical profession? Can we draw a comparison? Accountants, engineers, if they're an engineer who's not qualified, who can build a bridge that can collapse if people are walking too fast or too many I did a quick research, well research is a big word for spending a few hours at Google, but uh, I quickly looked at what kind of regulations do you have in the medical profession. I had to adjust my, my picture of the medical profession because that's also very complicated, mixed, and not so straightforward as you might think. Nevertheless, it's a longer tradition in terms of codes, in terms of regulations, in terms of professional areas. Maybe we should have a look at that, we should draw some comparisons and see where we can make use of what others have and what should we avoid because they've made also mistakes. And I've addressed the chartered, registered, certified post nominal issue already. I'm a chart no, I'm not chartered. I'm a registered EDP auditor, a long time ago, EDP auditor, I'm a certified information systems auditor. Basically the same thing. Ah, now this, uh, be, yeah. do you have any remarks, questions on the previous slide? Because now I have put a few slides with questions I would like to have your views, your reactions, and, and discuss it. Because this is actually the first one. Do you feel that we should be comparable to one of these, or maybe another, that we should put effort and time in, in investigating what should be done locally, regionally, globally, or are you happy with your profession as you are at the moment? 
but otherwise maybe a few of those enthusiastic lunatics like me continue thinking this is important while where it's maybe not. Stuart. I've never seen in the discussion, I have professional liability insurance for about three million. I have to pay it every year to consultants. Is that part of it? Have you, I've never seen anything about insurance. Well, that's, that's uh, in the ICP field, as far as I know, which it's not very common. It's mandatory for our consultants in our world. From a government perspective? No. From, from your supplier's perspective? Well, that's, that's an element I, I have no clue on. It's, it's, uh, I don't have it, because I'm not working for a, a bank which doesn't require it. It doesn't require it, okay. No. The Norwegian bank would. Have you personally or through your employer? Personally. Well, it's Pers a personal company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, it's, it's, I'm not aware of that, but it's a requirement in, in, in my country. But in contract? Yeah. yeah. You have a personal liability insurance. I'm not aware of that. Professional liability insurance. Yeah. It's actually quite cheap. But... Uh, well, whether it's cheap or expensive, that, that's the second element. But the fact that people don't think about it, or it's not mandatory, or yeah. It's just ignored. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's one of those elements, if you look at developing a profession, is that something to pursue or not? It's a human aspect. If you have an insurance, will you act more responsible or less responsible? Because you feel uncovered anyway. Any other reactions on this one? Yes. Yes, uh, depends on what is looked upon as a profession because you mentioned it. So your comment was, uh, could an engineer build a bridge that would not uh, stay up? And the answer is, uh, I think there are many engineers that would build a bridge. Like you have, a, because engineering is not one uh, homogeneous profession, you have a chemical engineers who very well build a building that doesn't stay together very well. A building engineer maybe is not very good at chemical engineering and electronics and so on and so on. So uh, engineering is not a straightforward Probably just like medical profession is not one homogeneous area of expertise. And uh, in that sense, I have another comment related to ICT profession because I'm not quite comfortable with ICT profession as a label. Because uh, in IT, for example, it's information profession. And uh, they don't necessarily have to be related to IT. I mean, you have IT 8.8, 8.3, 8.3, 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. whatever, 6. And they are not necessarily all about ICT. It's all, so what I mean is information profession is including IT, but it's not necessarily always intertwined with IT. Okay. There was two comments here on the front side. One is reflecting on um, basically the, the notion, is it one profession or is it a profession of professions? What, what the gentleman said is, also in the engineering field and also in the medical field, it's not uh, one specific engineer that builds a bridge. Um, you need different expertise, different different um, types of engineers, different types of medical professions that have to, to uh, help you if you're sick, if you're ill, or have to help build a bridge. So the comparison indeed is still valid then, because even in those fields you have more disciplines, more types of professions, and that applies to ICT as well. The second remark is actually saying you're not, if I translate it correctly, you're not happy with the term ICT profession. Yes. Um, because that could give the, the impression that yes. it's only ICT people yes. making up that profession, where there's a lot of other disciplines needed to make sure that systems are uh, safe and secure and doing what they want to do. Yes. Okay, thank you. I think that, thank you for that comment, that, that reflects a few of the, the questions I, I put in, and the second one I will uh, show in a minute as well. Another element for discussion, if, if you look at skills, education, competencies, in the last two or three years, many governments and also professional bodies and, and, and commercial researchers 
launched report saying we will face a huge shortage of skilled workforce in the ICT environment. Hundreds of thousands in the EU, they said, in the next 10 years, and what dates, they say we will need seven, eight hundred thousand ICT professionals in addition to what we have now. We will never manage to, to supply that, given the, the status and the inflow of, of uh, students, Professionals. So, what does it mean? Where will we get those people? Will we lower our requirements? Will we lower the expectations? Do we run a bigger risk if we hire people with less qualifications? Will the education system be able to manage that, to catch up, and then run the risk that in 10 years' time you have supplied these 8, 900,000, and then the demand will drop? Competency, I mentioned, will it, will it affect the competencies? And the duty of care. Are people more willing to take more risks? And okay, this is not. You need the job done, and you don't have people, so put more pressure on it. Like I said, companies should, should provide an environment where the pressure is, is balanced. Any reactions to this? Yes. I'm not sure. I knew the report, but I'm not sure if they are talking of cheap professionals. <laughs> And not, not really to pay. Well, that, that's an interesting one because, and I, I have to admit, I haven't read the reports from the first to the last pages. I mean, there's more of them, and in Australia has launched a report a few years ago, which was well received by government and by industry. But I believe they are not specifying what kind of jobs you're talking about. But I think in general, and, and personally, if I if I look at the development and if you see the, the work uh, being done now in, in the area of Internet of Things, in artificial intelligence and robotics, we will have a shortage in the higher level jobs as well. <coughs> I'm not so sure about the lower level jobs. But then again, system maintenance has to be done as well. And network maintenance, and I'm not saying that that's a lower level, but it's different levels. So, Maybe uh, the people who draft such reports should, should make a better distinction in that. I don't know. But in any case, it's, it's crystal ball work, to be honest. I think it's, it would be difficult to do it in general, but in areas where it's got an effect on other, so we say, human beings. I think your country has actually just started something which is. Um, Quite interesting way we need to register if you're a forensic specialist, you need to register. You need to register as an expert to be Dutch, well, it's called the NFD or the Dutch um, register for forensic expert. You cannot work in the Dutch courts, which is quite critical, and it needs to be controlled um, without that registration. And one thing I've just been involved in the session today, it's really expensive to actually evaluate the people properly. Otherwise, it just becomes another simple certification. And I think in general, it would be difficult, but in specific areas where it's got an effect that could influence people in terms of anything that affects their quality of life, it should be looked at in focus on those areas that depend on, on the practicality of just doing it and also the cost. It's not um, a cheap exercise. General, I've been in the industry for many, many years, and um, I don't think, you know, being registered for ICT professional is just doing really normal development work, but we can't do that much. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll follow up on that in a second. Yeah. I think the first time I'm going to follow up with Axel being a little bit late, I got first to be in the, in the university. Uh, I missed the beginning of your speech, so I'm not quite sure because I can see there are two different things you do with care. One is uh, related to the security aspect. The other one is the purpose of the professional who's supposed to benefit from the system in the first place in their job. Now, in, in healthcare, you often have a conflict of interest where you say, okay, is the system supposed to, su supposed to support the professional to be able to do the job? as opposed to, is the system supposed to be secure? 
Now, uh, uh, in, in the medical profession, they have a lot of conflicts with IT support because the, I, the imposed security routines are already hindering effective uh, uh, medical practices. And so when we talk about duty of care, from a professional point of view, from somebody who is not an IT or ICT professional, uh, duty of care is not necessarily cyber security uh, the most priority because you could have the number one priority for medical profession is the care of the patient and cyber security is secondary. Now from ICT security profession it could be the complete opposite and therefore we can imagine a conflict of interest when it comes to duty of care. Yes, there is, the gentleman is mentioning uh, conflict of interest in the term duty of care, where on the one side the system should do what the system is supposed to do in helping, for instance, uh, in the medical system, they should help curing patients. And if on the other side the specialists make the system so secure that it's becoming difficult to handle or impossible to handle, you have a conflict of interest. Absolutely true. That's why it's, it's important that both uh, sides of, of the professionals, the, the user side, the doctor who is using the system or the equipment, is involved in the discussion. But the ICT security professional should raise issues because if the system helps the doctor in curing the patient but it's not secure, I'm not sure whether I would be the patient. I would like to be the patient because you never know how the system will behave, whether it's doing what it's supposed to do. So if somebody can influence the system and making it unavailable or feeding wrong data, it's not helping the patient either. So the conflict of interest is not that big a conflict. I think both have the same interest in a way. It is difficult to, to find the right balance, making it usable, friendly, user friendly, usable, and also as secure as possible. And that's where, where one of the things I'm not sure whether it's the next one. No, that's another one. I think that that's where you, you have to work together and see there's always a balance. But make sure that you uh, have taken care of your professional duty of care. As a security specialist, you have to point out, you have to say, look, if you want to have a system like this that has to do that uh, job, take into account that these are security risks, and these are ways to handle it, this is the effect on the system. Whether the person or the, the company that is building the system will take all the advice on board, it's not exactly your call. It's the same like if, I, if I'm advising my board, say, look, you shouldn't take that risk, and my board takes the risk, I have done my job. I've done my duty of care, I've pointed out the risk, and I'm not calling the shots. It's, it's, you're right, it's a conflict of interest, but it needs to be addressed on both sides. One of the questions that I raised, I guess, in, in, in an earlier sheet, who should have security education? Should we all have? Yes, most of you are security professionals. But you're a minority. Most of the ICT professionals are trained in different areas. Should they all have a minimum basic security education? I'm not sure what the curriculum point of view is at the moment, whether it's enforced or whether you have to do an add-on. Training, should it be mandatory, to what level, how long, is a course of two weeks enough, or should you do a program of a year, I don't know. And that reflects a little bit on the, on the remark made by a differentiation. Um, should there be a mechanism that enforces minimum levels of professionalism for specific areas, like, like digital forensics, for instance? Should you make a distinction? Is there an area where you say, I don't care? Just build the system and when it fails, no problem, no harm done, no lives lost, limited damage in, in financial aspects. Other areas, when lives are at stake, uh, when, when forensics uh, needs, needs a proper uh, training. Should we have a mechanism that distinguishes how should we go forward? Any reactions to this? Are you in full agreement with me? BCS for the contract, which is a bit more generic for the IT professionals. Security plays a big role, and I was very intrigued by uh, the gentleman saying at the front. Because 
some kids because of the PFM work, we want to the university. We were finding home with PCS and we put a lot of stress and responsibility to the developer. We use a case study that we had um, in GP surgery where they were holding um, the sensitive data for vulnerable women. And we put a lot of pressure on the students and I feel you're the one who's developing the project. You're already really disability really aware of the security aspect. We've got a lot of budget, but it just doesn't really feel like we're going to go ahead with the project or not. Um, so I think from a BCS perspective, it's quite important that we all need to have a level of understanding when it comes to security. If we can't deal with it, we need to find a responsible person to actually sort out this. Thank you. And in my opinion, uh, in the banking industry, there is a security standard for anybody dealing with a MasterCard or Visa or credit cards. And they need to recertify every single year, every single person working in that area. For example, yeah? in, in developing payment systems yeah. with, with the usage of cards. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I think in terms of banking, Basel III certification, I mean, are you subject to that? No, well, Basel III is more financial risk, um, uh, risk and financial uh, requirements in terms of liquidity and, and solvability. It's, they are, Basel III in itself doesn't impose security requirements. There are security requirements for system operators, but not on the level we're talking about. They're not putting requirements on the professionals. Well, they, they address it. They mentioned that it uh, should be qualified personnel, but that's it. It doesn't yeah. go into detail. Is that, I think that's one of the problems of mixing up the concept of risk management and security. Yeah. She's talking about the security problem, but it's basically a risk management problem. And IT risk versus financial risk, and managers understand the word risk. Yeah. yeah, but yes, but then the discussion is still how, how much risk do we feel should be left to the discretion of, of people who maybe don't understand enough about the risks? Okay. Well, I think on, during the presentation I, I briefly hinted upon the fact that changing behavior and culture is, is not so easy. In my company, in my division, we are doing a security awareness program at the moment. Uh, you, might, you might think, is this recorded? Yes. <laughs> you might think that uh, professionals in, in a banking environment, in a central banking environment, are very security aware. Yes, we are. But put them into a security awareness program and they say, well, why do we have to do that? And what a nonsense. And we know what's happening. And I know how to behave. And then you'll find secret documents laying around on printers. You'll find doors open with confidential information. Within our environment, it's not so easy to get into the building, but nevertheless, still the, the, the culture, the attitude is, is uh, difficult to change. So there's research needed how to change the attitude, how to change cultures. Which kind of program is, is appealing, punishment, rewarding, um, giving out bottles of wine for the most secure person in the world, in the, sorry, in the department. So it's, it's not only technical, and I'm not sure whether we can ever say this fully. I'll skip the, the harmonization of, of the EU. Uh, this is my final slide, I think, 50? Yeah. I said 52, but that's the credentials. 50 is the final slide. Continue the research in every area you can imagine where human aspects are important. And I've seen the program of the next three days, and here for one day, and I'm unlucky that I couldn't stay for the whole event. You're addressing many areas, many aspects, which is very, very helpful and very useful. Continue doing that. Get engaged in the discussions with industry, with your governors, with your bodies of knowledge, with your professions. Build the profession, or build the professions, as we have maybe concluded. Make sure that even if you have a specialized area, make sure that, that you can show to the outside world that you're doing whatever you need to do, to be trustworthy, to be knowledgeable, and to, to deserve the trust. One thing that's uh, 
drive my heart. Those of you who are working in the technical area, use technology, develop technology that helps the poor user and even the professional to, make, to, to, to use the measures. I've used a few examples. And in my environment now, we have single sign-on. Great. So I don't have to remember 10, 15 different passwords for all the systems that I'm allowed to use. Great. So I don't have to remember anything. If one of those 10, for whatever technical reasons, fails, I have no clue how to solve it anymore because I forgot the password. I don't know how to restore it. So I have to go back to the help desk, wait for two days, and then I get my, my access again. Help us. We have a building access system which works with blood veins, the vein pattern in your fingers. Wonderful, in summertime. One click, you get in within three seconds. In wintertime, fortunately, I've, I seem to be a hot blooded person, so I have no problem in entering. But many of my colleagues, they have five minutes in After five minutes, you get in the building. So think about the technology needed to, to make security measures easy to use make them work. That's my story for today. Right on time. No more time for questions. I can like I said, this for reference, a lot of groups working on that in the, in the computer societies, BCS, of course. Many of them are working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you.